Okay, welcome to everyone who's joining us online. We're doing fungi this morning, good high yield area. So, Shane, you want to lead us off? Yeah, so there's some larger kind of deposits in the hypodermis. Kind of they're like endospores inside of those things, but they're certainly bigger than the monitor cells. Like the <coughs> so they're about the size of coxie, although some are smaller, like this. And they certainly have endosporulation, which is one way that coxie can appear. The other way that it appears actually more commonly <coughs> is with the lacy cytoplasm without the endospores, which we'll see examples of. So you want to recognize it both ways. But that is a good example of coccidioidomycosis with endosporulation. Very good. Well done. So, com compact hypercryptosis. Yep. I was closer to the corner to see if there's anything suspicious for Tinian. So you have a little circle with a dot in the middle, and then lots of little circles where you don't necessarily see the dot, and they tend to live right above the granular layer. You commonly have a layered corneum. So if you look, let's get it on the monitor here. Oops. It does not want to cooperate. So you commonly have a layered corneum with basket weave on top of compact red, and within the compact red is where you tend to see your fungi. So, tinea, very good. James, what do you think? Mm -hmm. uh, Cryptococcus. Cryptococcus. Why crypto? Because there are many organisms in a gelatinous condominium, and different sizes, characteristic of cryptococcus. <laughs> Very good description. So, um, crypto can be granulomatous or gelatinous. Ge gelatinous is more common. Uh, in gelatinous crypto, you see the big mucinous uh, capsule, and within that mucin, you have multiple pleomorphic yeasts. So you said basically everything key. It's multiple organisms to a white space, whereas most fungi are one white space, one organism. This is multiple organisms in the white space. The white space tend to be round to oval, but vary in size and shape. The organisms vary in size and shape and tend to be ovoid. So, very good. So, Cryptococcus. We see an arrow, really good to follow that. Actually, in this case, I like this area better than anything the arrow had to show us. So maybe it looks like some vertically oriented? So vertically oriented, but they're not just in the corneum, right? Yeah, they're in the tissue as well. And <coughs> when you look at them, Paige, do you see mainly a cell a refractile cell wall at the edge, or do you see mainly bubbly cytoplasm in the middle? Bubbly cytoplasm Yeah, I mean, there's really <coughs> not much of a wall there at all. It's just bubbly cytoplasm in hyphae. And then in areas, they make these soap bubble-like swellings. 
So what has hyphae with blue bubbly cytoplasm, essentially no visible refractile wall, and a tendency to form soap bubble-like swellings? Anyone want to help us? Fusarium. So both aspergillus and fusarium do the thin bubbly blue hyphae with no refractile wall. Of the two, aspergillus is incapable of making the soap bubble-like swellings. Fusarium loves to make those soap bubble-like swellings. The reason the two are important is for fusarium, you usually need to switch to voriconazole, which is a much more toxic drug, so it's never part of their antifungal prophylaxis. So usually people these days, they're on something like a nikinacandin as prophylaxis that covers candida. So candida sepsis death has gone way down. It covers most aspergillus, so aspergillus death has gone way down. In many hospitals, the most common opportunistic fatal fungal pathogen now is fusarium, specifically because it's not covered by the echinocandins, and you have to use for it. So, you know, this one's really important because it's our most common cause probably of hospital fungal sepsis in most parts of the world. As you get to the humid southeast, Pheohyphromycosis is right up there as a cause of sepsis. It shares the soap bubble-like swellings. It differs in that it has a very thick, prominent, refractile wall outside of the cytoplasm. Um, almost all pheohyphromycosis that we see is bipolaris specifera, which is common mildew. And um, that, that appearance is really bipolaris specifera, but since that's almost all of the invasive pheosepsis that we see, you know, it's pretty recognizable. So Everything again... Everything is most certainly okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so, pheo versus fusarium which is probably, you know, in clinical practice, the most important to distinguish. Pheohyphromycosis, thick refractile wall. Fusarium, no thick refractile wall. Both of them bubbly blue cytoplasm. Both of them soap bubble-like swellings. So it's that thick refractile wall that distinguishes the black mold from fusariosis. And the color is not very reliable. And the color <laughs> is not at all reliable. Yeah. I mean, if you see that they're actually brown in tissue, you've got it. But that would be maybe one in a hundred biopsies where you're lucky enough to see that. They grow black in tissue and yet there's very little visible melanin in histologic section. And if you stain with a Fontana, almost any fungus can be positive <coughs> with Fontana because all fungi produce melanin. So Fontana is too sensitive is its problem. Visual appreciation of brown hyphae is not sensitive enough, and so you have to go with morphology. <coughs> And, you know, for all of these, the problem is by the time you culture it, the patient's dead. So, you know, it really is a call based on morphology. <coughs> so I think I might be seeing lots of little organisms about the size of other cells around. Um. Yeah, we also have a lot of reactive fibroblasts. So we want to make sure we're not mistaking any of that for for organism. There's a lot of amphiphilic background that mm. may be bacterial debris, so this may be a synergistic infection of some sort. Let's see if we can make out really good hyphae. Good place to look is dead vessels because they're what's killing the vessels. 
Um, and I think we're going to pass on this one just because we're not seeing enough of them to make them really stand out. Which one that wasn't actually truly in this chapter? Okay. No, that's okay. Um, there, there were some hyphy on there, but um, let's move on. Okay. Certainly not that we're jumping out or easy to find. And in general, you know, it um, like on the pathology board exam, it shouldn't be a bug hunt of can you find the organism. It should be here's the organism, can you recognize the organism? Which is why images are sometimes. So is that like a, um, a green? The way they do. I'm sorry. Say it again. Like a green. Yep, a green. Like a mycetoma. And so green goes with either mycetoma right. or um, botryo. Botryo. Right. So botryo is caused by staph. Staph aureus. So it's just huge staphylococcal green. So we're going to look higher. This is not made of cocci. It's made of little blue filaments. So what kind of mycetoma, what organisms are likely? Um, so I'm just thinking of the bacterial ones like Nericardia and Actinomycetoma. Uh, so yeah, so it's an Actinomycetoma rather than a fungal. Because fungal, you're going to see what look like hyphae, hollow, yeah. clear spaces, right? This is little, thin, blue, amphiphilic filaments. That's bacterial, filamentous bacteria. So that's going to be nocardia. Actinomyces. Yeah. So um, the um, actinomycetes of various sorts. So actinomyces, as in lumpy jaw, which is a mycetoma. Um, nocardia, which is most of the mycetomas you'll actually see on people's legs, are nocardia. They're not fungal in the new world, which is great because you can treat them with Bactrim. So people get limbs amputated for something that could have been cured cheaply with Bactrim. Um, and then you have um, the Actinomedora or Streptomyces pelletieri, which <coughs> forms red grains. So that one kind of um, stands out because the grains are distinctly red. Most of the other bacterial mycetomas are pale white to yellow grain. Dark grain tend to be black molds. Red grain really stands out. Um, and if you remember pelletieri, it sounds like pellet sounds like palette. So you're painting lots of red paint on your palette for the pelletieri. Okay. Skip that. Okay. So what do you see mm -hmm. at scan? So it looks like either maybe a foreign. Body yeah, what kind of foreign body? Um, looks like maybe not a splinter, but, or is it a splinter? Yeah. Like so um, <laughs> you're doing it Jeopardy style, but um, <laughs> that is... What is? Uh, what, what is a splinter, yes. So <laughs> you have <coughs> things that are box-like with prominent cell walls. Remember, cell walls, fungi have them, plants have them, animals don't have them. They just have a cell membrane, right? So that's wood. That's a splinter. When you see a splinter in tissue, always look within the splinter because it's very common to have fungal organisms um, within the splinter. And then you also want to look in the wall to see you know, if the if the fungi have germinated and are now in the tissue. So most phaomycotic cysts start with a splinter implantation, and then you get granuloma and you get fung fungi within the wall. I'm not making out a whole lot of fungi 
here in the wall, but if we look at the splinter, you can see two types of things with cell walls. You see the wood with its cell walls, and then you see something linear in it that is browner. You know, that's probably a phao organism within that splinter. Was if you have a giant cell, a pustule, um, or a piece of wood, those are all good places to look for fungal organisms. Looks like uh, either acral skin. So probably acral skin. And what do you have in the acral skin? That like pigmented okay. and you have pigmented hyphae in that acral skin, and in this case, you can really make out that they're brown, right? So this is probably tinea nigra. So tinea nigra tends to be palmaris mm -hmm. or plantaris. You most of it you see on the foot, but occasionally you'll see it on the palm. Uh, tinea nigra is almost exclusively in the southeastern United States. Um, in the when we were in Texas and we're getting past specimens from all over the country, we'd get um, from places like Biloxi, we'd get probably two or three of these a year as a huge excision by a surgeon from a Palmer sole for melanoma. Um, and basically, it has to be humid enough that even the people mildew because it's just mildew, like in your tub, <laughs> um, on your palm or sole. And <coughs> it's brown hyphae within the corneum. Do you see it clinically here a lot? Um, you know, I haven't seen one yet here, but we used to see it, um, San Antonio is plenty humid in the summer. You, you know, Dallas is across the dry line. Dallas, they don't tend to see it. San Antonio, you see it all along the coastal south. Houston, it's, I think they consider you a freak if you don't have it. And, um, you know, here I would expect that we would see it. Okay, so what do you see here? Large specimen, um, kind of in the PEH. Large specimen, yeah, PEH, and PEH would have um, correlated to what clinically? Uh, like a papillomatous plaque. Yeah, papillomatous or verrucoid. <laughs> so something verrucous. And then what else is present? Um, looks like just a bunch of bacteria, like super secondary infection, I'd imagine. Yeah, or lots of this, uh, lots of nuclei with little segmented bodies. So Just lots of neutrophils. So it would have been something verrucous and crusted, mm -hmm. right? So things that give you newts in the horn. It's your p ticks differential, so psoriasis, tinea, more importantly for this one, infantigo, um, canada, subderm, syphilis. Yeah. So you you know you want to look in that to see if you could see organisms, and they're often very focal, so you have to kind of look around until you see them. What would you expect candida to look like? So our candida is often vertically um, aligned. Exactly. You can have your pseudo hyphae. Tinea tends to be horizontal, candida tends to be vertical. Um, we got a few in here, you can see that that's a vertical line kind of a gray amphipelic organism and it's oriented vertically. So if it helps you remember it, tinea swims, candida dives. So, you know, the one's horizontal, the other's vertical. This doesn't 
look like it belongs in this chapter at all. Because that's sort of a malignant horn and there's actinic keratosis. Um, it may have been put in for these guys, which are what? Um, spores. There's something in the corn, though. It looks like there's hyphae in the shadow corneum. Yeah, and people often um, trip up on these. You have all those little blue stipples in there, and then the pink on the outside. Those are demodex. Okay. Hmm. So the demodex, you know, people will miscall them as bacteria or as spores. But that's all just part of the Demodex body, and then you can see its ugly little legs on the outside here as pink, these pink things, little stubby legs hanging <coughs> off of it. There was something, the yeah, there's something Let's in the see. horn. Yeah. Yes, there's some TV in the horn. There you go. Good for you. So, and tinea versicolor, as opposed to regular tinea, you don't tend to get the layered corneum. In fact, it tends to be an orthokeratotic loose horn. And whereas tinea, regular tinea, appears basically clear, doesn't pick up stain, tinea versicolor appears blue. It picks up stain in H and E. So if you see it staining blue, that's tinea versicolor. Candida and tinea tend not to stain. Very good. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Lots of pus. And we got that. Grains here. Grains, and these grains <coughs> are made of. Let's see if we can go a little. Get one in the middle there. That doesn't want to stay. Okay, let's try it again. So when you look at it, it's made of little things that are long or little things that are round? Little things that are round. More. So it's a cluster of little round, loose staining things. So, you know, I think the one was bacteria, but we're not really... Yeah, uh, so, so like probably bacteria. bacterial forming grains and they're little <coughs> round cocci, so mm -hmm. that would be botrymycosis, yeah. correct. Very good. I see, I see little small organisms. So, and the organisms are within giant cells, pustules, or histiocytes? Looks like they're coming in the cytoplasm of histiocytes. So they're within histiocyte cytoplasm. They're really, there's a lot of variation in size and shape of everything between the organisms which we think crypto. <coughs> so that would make you worry about gelatinous crypto when there's a lot of variation in size. These are a little small maybe for crypto, although you can get fooled because crypto gets really small when it's granulomatous. If you look at the one right by the tip of the arrow up on the screen, you can see yeah, it has a blue organism and then a little white halo around it, a little white pseudocapsular halo, um, which is good for histoplasma. So histoplasmosis, usually evenly spaced within the histiocyte, not clustered, not at the periphery of the vacuole like leishmaniasis. It's unusual for it to vary so much in size. African histo, of course, is larger. And then the one thing, you know, for the fellows and for the path residents, 
if you see histo in a lung, it looks totally different. When histo hits oxygen, despite the high temperature, it becomes hyphal. So his cavitary histo in a lung, it's no longer those little dots and histocytes, it's hyphae growing. Same thing, endovascular histo. You'll see histo within veins, it's hyphae. It's not the little dots. Um, and you will see it sometimes on prosthetic valves and various things like that. So you get a little bit of a layered horn, so you'd look for something inside of that. Above it as well and then uh, it's above it, and the stuff above it, is that a parakeratotic horn? Is it an orthokeratotic horn? It's just ortho. It's and scale. yet it's flaking off. Scale is usually parakeratosis, except for what scale? Like a the furforaceous scale of tinea versicolor, which is loose orthokeratotic. And then in here, we don't see many ZD, but we see meatballs. And are they clear or are they staining blue? They look a little bit more blue. Which is typical for tinea versicolor. Or in this case, you're seeing the yeast phase, bitter sporum. Um, can you grow it just on regular sap roads? No. What do you have to add? Yeah. Exactly. So remember, it's ZD and meatballs. What would you add? You'd add olive oil, right? <laughs> so the, it needs the lipid environment. Why does tinea versicolor look like your central chest? Because it's greasy. And so it needs the extra oil, and so you typically add olive oil because that's the natural thing to add to ZD and meatballs. Um, okay. So this one, I'll tell you right out, you're not going to see an organism. What you're going to see is a pattern of inflammation. Um, and the organism grew in culture. And this one, yeah, it's, not, it's not the best. But you have pus, and around that pus you're getting a few histiocytes. As that became better organized, it would be a stellate abscess surrounded by histiocytes. What kind of things can do that? So in this chapter, sporo, with the uh, bigger mnemonic for that, clats, so cat scratch, lymphogranulum of venereum, atypical mycobacterium, especially amerinum, tularemia, sporo. And you, you actually see those things in real life. You'll see someone who has either an ulceroglandular or lymphangitic spread, and then they have um, stellate abscesses with granuloma, and you've got to run through your little mnemonic and <coughs> see what you have to cover them for. In this part of the world, we see lymphangitic sporo commonly, and we also see nocardia, and we're also on the coast, so we see amerinum. So, you know, all of those we're going to see clinically. So, James, what do you see? This is bolus tinea. Well, so what do you see histologically? And um, how are you arriving at a diagnosis of ballistinia? Well, first clue, chapter. Second clue, um, like all this edema and like breaking down of the keratinocytes. Like a so you have reticular degeneration, a lot of subcapsular edema. You have some neutrophils in the horn, which of psoriasis, tinea, and patigo candida, subderm syphilis. <coughs> um, tinea would be the one that can also produce the reticular degeneration and the subcapsular edema. The other thing is, if you look at your corneum, you have a basket weave corneum and under it a nice thin layer of deep red corneum. 
So you have a layered corneum as a hint that it may be tinea. So you are correct, Pullis tinea. Um, real life and exams, you don't have the benefit of knowing what chapter you're in, unfortunately. That is yeah. a fact. So you have some pus. Um, so you have some pus, and then what else do you have? It looks like kind of rigid walls. Flip the condensers. So we have cell walls. So what do you think that's a bit of? Um, maybe splinter. Yeah, splinter. And then anytime you have a splinter, you're going to want to see is did anything hitch a ride in the splinter? Mm -hmm. and you got these little round, refractile brown things. Um, if they're kind of hard to tell in these, some of them, you know, you could be seeing a cross section of hyphae, or if they just stay round like that and divide by fission, you know, form a little plate across them then that would be good for chromo. Okay. So, chromomycosis, um, indolent, cutaneous infection, phaomycotic cyst, indolent, cutaneous infection, disseminated phaohyphomycosis, lethal. Acanthosis of the epidermis. Acanthosis, spongiosis, spongiosis, lots of plasma cells, which could be a clue to location. Uh, and do you see much of a corneum? No, there's no granule there. So may I mean hmm. could, even could this be, be mucosal? Like, like lip, lip yeah. mucosa. Mm -hmm. And then you've got Newts in what little corneum there is. Yeah. So, so newts in a horn on a lip. So thinking Canada. Yeah, something? thinking Canada, and then yeah, I'm not seeing it in this particular section. I don't know if anyone else saw it go by. I didn't, but you know that would be a, certainly a good histology for Canada on a lip. Hmm. That's probably where we get a little more pus. Okay. We're more likely to. Find the organism, and there's a little gray thing vertical there. But you'd expect just because you have pus on a lip, you you probably have candida. Okay. PH with pus. PH with pus. Do you have a mnemonic for PH with pus? I do. <laughs> Here come big green leafy vegetables. And what does it stand for? Halogenoderma, chromo, um, blasto, uh, granone, gonali, leash, and pea vegetables. And it's important to have it because they're not all infectious. Right? There's halogenoderma in there, there's pemphigus vegetans in there, so you have to remember that you know you may need a DIF, you may need history for halogen exposure. And then occasionally you have other fungi that aren't normally on the list that produce it. What produced it in this case? Is that like a spheral? That is a large spherule with a lacy cytoplasm. Okay, so so that is coxy, coccidioidomycosis. Mm. Which can do verrucous lesions sometimes too. What is coxy? <laughs> oh, Jeopardy. you're doing Jeopardy. Yes. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of inflammation, lots of granulomatous inflammation. Let's see if we can find. Let's see if we can find really good areas. 
areas where it stands out. We got one there, we got one there, one here. This probably all continues as a chain. Like Lobo? Lobo. Good for you. Where do you see Lobo? Where in the world is Lobo? In dolphins. Here. In dolphins. And where do dolphins get Lobo? In keloidal. In keloidal lesions, actually, dolphins get septic and like wash up on shore. People get more of the keloidal lesions, but um, dolphins get lobo in warm coastal areas where people retire, and you start getting lots of sewage effluent going into salt mm -hmm. or brackish water. Um, doesn't sound like any place I know of, <laughs> yeah. but you know that's where you tend to get Lobo. Um, so you know, Florida, Carolinas are are Lobo territory. So linear pop beads are what you'd expect. <coughs> okay, so. The scalper face probably lots of lots of inflammation. Scalper face, lots of inflammation. Mm. And then uh, there you go. So tinea, just an endothrix in this case. So an endothrix and what kind of thing <coughs> would give you endothrix? Tonsorans most So commonly. if it's a scalp, tonsorans most commonly. Um, but also T rubrum. Miyake's granuloma looks identical. Right? So Miyake's granuloma T. rubrum would look identical to an endothrix fungus on the scalp. Okay. So got kind of loose areas with granulomatous inflammation. So we're going to look in there. Mm -hmm. You got a bug here. Um, they kind of look like they're like the. Is it like the African histo? So <laughs> they are within giant cells. They're too big for a regular histoplasmosis. You know, you might think of things like lobo. You might honestly think of things like granulomatous crypto too, except. Remember, this is about the size of what crypto is when it's um, in a gelatinous crypto. Granulomatous crypto is supposed to be smaller, so this would be a little too big for granulomatous crypto. Also, they're not. There's no capsule, you know, true gelatinous mm -hmm. capsule at all, and they're round, whereas crypto tends to be oval. So, with all of that. African histo makes perfect sense. And um, then African histo sometimes is monkey skin. I think, I mean, this, given that you have a lot of, um, of hairs that are an antigen, not telogen, I think it's probably human skin, not, like human extremity skin, not monkey skin. Mm -hmm. Got a crust. Got granuloma. Anything sitting in the granuloma? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So if those are just spores, not hyphae, then this is. Then it's chromo. Then it's chromo, and if it forms hyphae, then it's. Then it's phao hyphomycosis. You know, both black mold infections. <coughs> so, you've got kind of a fibrous capsule around this. Kind of. So, I want to go in and look for. 
many issues from there. So you got a big abscess and you got a fibrous capsule and so you know you would want to scan the granuloma for organisms including demetaceous fungi. And there's some lipofusion pigment in there, but let's see if we see really good hyphae. There's some in there, and you can see that they have vesicular swellings, you know, which would lead you possibly to fusarium. But if you see thick wall anywhere, then it leads you to Something black missing. molds, and there you see some pigmented. So that's a soap bubble. Let's see if we can mm. get it into the field. For He's online. There we go. It's right at the edge of the field. You see soap bubble like swelling, and you see brown pigment, and you see a refractile wall. So you put all that together, that is a filamentous black mold. And, you know, in a walled off abscess, that's a phaomycotic cyst. that then you go on a bug hunt. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see if we can find some really good areas here. Uh, I think we may have to go <coughs> to a different example for that one. Let's just switch to something different. Mm -hmm. So when you look at scan here, skin looks okay. Vessels, there's something funky going on with the vessels, right? So let's look at the vessels. So what's going on with the vessels? Bubbly blue cytoplasm. Bubbly blue cytoplasm, so an angiotropic organism. In general, organisms that are not angiotropic don't cause sepsis. Folk organisms that are angiotropic like to go into and necrose blood vessels. Those then are going to be sepsis producing organisms. You say there's blue cytoplasm and very little refractile wall. And they're vesicular swellings. So what is this? This is fusariosis. So how are you going to treat it? Yeah, you're probably going to have to go to Vori. Um, and you did that based on morphology in a critically ill septic patient and got him on the right drug. Well done. And, you know, a lot, many of these people will <coughs> die, but their chance of survival is on your nailing the organism and getting them on the right drug. So again, something that would probably be vasculotropic organism. So we're going to look. Let's see if we can find. So you see walls here. And do you see much bubbly cytoplasm, or do they look more hollow? More hollow. And is the wall <coughs> blue, or is the wall red? Red. So what would be a red, hollow, thick-walled organism? Mucor. That would be mucor group. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, mucor can respond 
to AMFO, especially um, the um, microencapsulated amphotericin, but often um, posiconazole, and there's some new antifungals that are active against um, mucor-type organisms, too. Oh, good. Thank you. Because that's an important one to, that we hadn't covered. Oh, okay. This is, you know, for pathboards, this would be the kind of slide you would want to get where finding the organism is not the challenge. Right? Protothecosis. Protothecosis. Why prototheca? Because they look like morulating soccer balls. So they look like soccer, bo soccer balls or morulae, like. Um, you know, when an embryo becomes a larger cluster of cells, and then these big black things are what they look like when they're non-morulating. Mm -hmm. And especially um, Prototheca zopfi, sometimes you just have sheets of the non-morulating forms, and so you have to recognize that. So where do you get, um, who gets Prototheca? Where, where in the country do you see Prototheca? Water. They live on the north side of trees where it's Ooh. very humid. Hmm. So do you know anywhere where it's very humid and they grow telephone poles and paper trees? Georgetown. So um, I, I suppose Oregon would be one of those places, but more like Georgia, Alabama, the Carolinas are um, Prototheca territory. So most of it is southeastern U.S., and it's people who have something to do with forestry usually. Um, and you'll see it with cutaneous lesions, but you'll also see it with Olecranon bursitis. That's a kind of a classic. Uh, um, lumberman with Olecranon bursitis, and then the Olecranon bursa is filled with these organisms. And they may be these big black eyeballs, or they may be the morulae. And either one is identifiable as Prototheca. So is Prototheca a fungal? Technically, you Algae? Yeah, it kind of lives right on the edge between algae and fungus, um, but it's classified mm -hmm. as an achloric alga. <coughs> okay, clinic time. Well done. Thank you.